that's what I think we really need to stop worrying about is like the really tiny changes that probably aren't going to matter. Once you've figured out your way of roasting and your uh, approach to it, you can then just start really simplifying the process so that you can start like spending a lot more time on other things that matter. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is sadly the last episode of a really great five-part series that I'm so happy to have survived with you, Mark, from Dialect Coffee when it comes to coffee roasting. And I just really hope that everyone out there that was so excited about you coming on the podcast isn't disappointed that I didn't know how to speak coffee roaster the way that they wanted to speak to you in coffee roaster. So thank you for doing this series. I really appreciate it. Um, in this what? series, we're talking about the past, present, and future of coffee roasting. Now, before we do that, hashtag free Palestine. Can you get out of the way of the pa- painting that's behind you? Um, it's a beautiful painting of a watermelon. So if you're only listening to this podcast, uh, we can um, – it's your sister who painted that, right? Yeah, yeah, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah, well done. It's beautiful. Um, And, you know, all the fuckery that's going on, free Palestine. Um, Anyway, next. So today we are talking, in the last episode, we talked about what people should be focusing on when it comes to coffee roasting. I feel like there's a lot out there that people think they should be focusing on, but they shouldn't be focusing on. And in this episode, we're going to talk about what are the things that people shouldn't be focusing on because perhaps it's distracting them from the things that they should be focusing on. So what are those things? Taking everything for granted and all the assumptions and all the dogmatic approaches and everything you're being told. I think it's, you know, it may sound like a bit of a cliche, but I think a lot of people do need to unlearn what they've learned and what they've been told. Because all of these things, they work in a certain environment for certain things and certain monoculture of coffees. I think the the most beautiful thing that we need to do is just start exploring out of the box and not worrying about all these tiny little changes. Just think about the things that really have significant impact on on what you're doing. And the only way to do that is to start taking yourself out of your comfort zone, stop you know, putting yourself on repeat, but then start putting the roaster on repeat a little bit more. So people should stop being so scared. Absolutely. One one of the one of the things I keep trying to push towards people is simplifying the roasting so it's, you know, either constant inlet air temperature or you make one change. And in that way, you only have to be there if if it's a manual roaster, you only have to be there for one part and just change it. Otherwise, if you constant inlet air temperature, you're just all the way through and then you're just changing that one temperature all the time. To, to adjust what you want or the batch size, for example. Um, and that, that's what I think we really need to stop worrying about is like the really tiny changes that probably aren't going to matter. Once you've figured out your way of roasting and your uh, approach to it, you can then just start really simplifying the process so that you can start like spending a lot more time on other things that matter. Do you think that people feel that it it diminishes them as a coffee roaster or their importance as a coffee roaster if they simplify it that much? Some people may think that way for sure, but it's also an opportunity for them to start realizing that, you know, there's so much more that they can be doing that's more valuable than, you know, babysitting the roaster. There's right. a lot more value in a lot more creativity for them to start exploring the different aspects that really impact it and start spending their time in parts where, you know, in, in the future we don't need to. I mean, it's, it's automation is is something that a lot of people are concerned of because the socio-economic impact that it can have. But at the same time, it's not like we're never 
going to need humans to tell us how to roast because, mm. you know, maybe we're probably 50 years away from being able to stick something like an electronic tongue into a coffee and tell us what it is. I mean, there's ways we can simplify that, but at least, you know, we're still going to need a human for now to figure out what coffees mm. to buy, figure out what, um, you know, what flavors we, we get out. Because that, that's the bit that we really need to get a really good connection with is trying to translate all these, you know, pretentious um, descriptors for coffees. I think that's the biggest thing that I keep thinking about is, you know, on, on, the, on the back of the, the dialect coffees, it's like acidity level, fruitiness level, bitterness level, and then like two descriptors. But half the time those descriptors work with the coffee that I've tasted in the water that I've used where I am at that time. And I think that's, that's the bit that really we need to work on as an industry is like trying to get more, um, quality control stuff in there so that we don't start telling people now that we've shifted completely and changed the way we roast from 50 years ago. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't done that, but the whole conversation around freshness is like a completely different story these days. Some of the copies that I roast don't taste good until week four or week five Word. and they're still tasting after week seven. So. It's, it's really weird that, you know, we've spent all this time trying to focus on all of this roasting stuff and thinking that flavor is the be all end all at a certain time, but that keeps developing, that keeps changing. So mm -hmm. who knows, maybe we, we should start focusing on a roast profile that actually does taste good at week 10, week 12. Maybe it makes coffee more is going to be better. At it, it makes more sense from, uh from a business perspective as well. I, you know what was something that was interesting? I don't know if you have heard of my one of my businesses, Elixir Specialty Coffee. Uh, it was a coffee that was brewed with sound waves. And we mm. were told at the time, like, we were crazy, and now because somebody did it in a coffee competition, now everybody wants to know how did Lee do the sound waves thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. That was my business. And we will be relaunching it. But the interesting thing that we found out was that there were specific kinds of coffees that didn't actually start to taste good until three months after they'd been roasted. And everybody said who knew about the fact that you know, the coffee roaster that was supplying us with the coffee was like, you're crazy. This coffee tastes terrible at three months. I'm like, how do you know? How do you know? Did you do you have some put aside to test it at three months? And they're like, no, but I'm like, that's my point. We're not testing these things in our industry. How do we how do we know that coffees aren't tasting good at three months? Well, this is the thing as well. So one of the one of the things that I've been speaking to a lot of roasters about is kind of how we try and re educate the people that we've educated to say that, you know, the fresh is the best because the way we roast has a huge impact on, on all of those things, mm -hmm. but, and maybe this is going to down, down a particular rabbit hole, but at least the, the coffee on, on the shelf behind me, these were all roasted like four or five weeks ago. And now I can no longer sell them because people have expectations that it's too old to taste. I have, I have one customer who keeps um, buying the old stuff and a lot of it to sell in his shop because that's when it's best tasting. So I'm taking all the storage hit. Don't worry about it. It's fine. But you <laughs> you're know, that, putting that, on skateboards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they're getting a great deal because the people who know my coffees and have tasted them, they've now, it's like, you know, it's, it's like an experiment that I ran to taste, you know, coffees after six weeks, eight weeks. Some people, when like even the fresh stuff is available, They'll buy the fresh one and a couple of the other ones that are a little bit older and they can taste for themselves. So it's kind of a weird problem that I have now that people actually start to wait until four weeks to buy it because I reduce the price because otherwise I can't sell it. So it kind of put me in a bit of a, you know, I've screwed myself, I've, you know, shot myself in the foot a little bit, but those people who know that it's going to be just as tasty, if not tastier after four weeks, get a better deal. So it's, it's so that's it's a, a business it's a weird thing. That's actually something that you offer older coffee. You'll sell that at a reduced price. Yeah, because otherwise, that's a what fantastic am I gonna do with it? business strategy. But I shouldn't have the problem of overstocking. That's 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 the real issue. Yeah. Like I should be able to fall, predict. But the only reason I do this is because I have more coffee than I need. But can I but, also say, what you're doing? 
this is me putting my consultant's hat on, you're also servicing a different market that no- normally wouldn't be able to have access perhaps to your coffee, right? Mm. And so I, what yeah. this is doing is it's creating a secondary, I know you didn't ask for consulting, but <laughs> here we go. Um, this is creating a secondary market category for you that could, as the cost of living crisis becomes a problem, end up being the bulk of what ends up becoming your um your customer base it's actually really quite a wonderful accident yeah because because all these coffees that i buy they're like the cheapest one i think i've bought so far is like 10 euros per kilo but typically i'm like kind of green that that is so like typically Mm -hmm. i'm on the higher end of 13 14 15 euros per kilo so to make any kind of it and make it a little bit sustainable because like wait you know not really a prof- full profit business at the moment because it's my side hustle but mm-hmm. at least to make some kind of money off it i sell it at a price that's kind of 15 um, euros that's the cheapest i do it is 15 euros per 200 gram bag mm-hmm. and you know what's beautiful about it is if people want it then they can grab it then but wait four weeks and then it's it's available for people at half that price, at basically a little bit more than cost price. So I'm still not losing money, but that's mm. the kind of coffee that otherwise, you know, there's there's creative ways that you can get rid of those kind of coffees. But this is a way that people still are tasting it and consuming it because what's wrong with that kind of coffee? Nothing. It tastes tastes just as good. I drink coffee that's weeks old, sometimes a months old. Uh, you know, mm. uh, you buy coffee from all over the world. You don't want to just wait for it to get a couple of weeks old and then stop drinking it. No, that's just wasteful. No, no. no. and maybe, maybe this is like an extra dimension that's, uh, like I say, has to go on to your quality control perspective. But at least this is where, again, we need to think about the future of coffee roasting is, you know, maybe not setting ourselves up for a fast moving consumer goods business because yeah. we don't have to be that you know, it's it's not like it's milk where it goes off super fast. You know, it's we we can maintain this for longer and it still tastes good. And I mean, a lot of people, it, it's the same in the craft beer industry. A lot of people are used to hoppy beers that are oxidized mm-hmm. because that's what's on the shelf markets and that's what ninety percent of people buy and taste. They taste stale beer, and for me, that flavor, I've been trained to taste it to a point where it's like gone off milk for me. Yeah, so I cannot right. drink that. Not necessarily the same for coffee. Coffee doesn't taste growth after eight weeks or 12 no. weeks. It, it's different. And maybe that different is someone's preference. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. It's so a lot massive. of people, a lot of, a lot of family and people who aren't, you know, specialty coffee nerd. Um, I was about to use another word that we mentioned earlier, but maybe I shouldn't use that. Um, but can. they're they're kind of... <laughs> But uh, I think their 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 flavors are you know towards the more yeah coffee like flavor. That's what their preference is, and so the the coffees they the acidity changes, the fruit the fruitiness changes, the bitterness changes. But for some people, it goes away from what they're preferred because that's what they're trained to to taste. But for mm. other people, it becomes a preference. So after four or six weeks, people are like, ah. Oh, this is delicious. This tastes more like what I'm familiar with, like, yeah. you know, the, the dried fruits, the raisins, the, the prunes. And those are kind of the, the drinking coffees, you know, the people that will drink it every day and a little bit more functional than, than you know, tasting coffees that are more for, you know, exploration and, you know, the, the triple IPAs of the coffee world of the extended fermentations and mm-hmm. hydro honeys and all this. But I think, I think that's, that's what we'll, this, what we also need to realize is that you know, you've got to cater for that market. And I think there is a, a way for roasters to not worry so much about it being a, a fast moving product and start thinking about how their, their roasting then affect those kind of things. Cause there's particularly different technologies, roasting technologies that enable you to have coffees like this. So for instance, the roasters that I'm using, the fluid bed roaster, it enables you to have coffee that tastes like this for a long time. So maybe with drum roasters, maybe that's not a possible thing. Maybe it doesn't right. develop in the same way. But there's a way that we can characterize that and understand that. And that's some of the stuff that I've been publishing recently as well. Um, it's how the physical properties are impacted by these first profiles. But it has such huge impact on everything downstream. And there are links in the show notes to that, folks. Before we wrap up this series, though, 
I want to ask you one other thing. When it comes to things that we shouldn't do, that we shouldn't focus on as coffee roasters, I want to ask you about hero worshipping in the industry. There's a lot of that goes that goes on with you coffee roasting folk. Mm-hmm. What is your um, what is your advice? Let's say you you strike me as quite the humble man. Uh, you're somebody who studied. You're somebody who knows your shit, and I, you don't come across to me as someone who is like acting like a, a coffee elitist. How would you advise coffee roasters that are listening to this when it comes to hero worshiping in the industry? Well, people, I, I think I think it's really important that people do it for themselves. They don't need someone to tell them what to do. You know, there's, there's you know, we're all adults in this business. You know, the, the idea is that we can think for ourselves and we can do that. But I think it just takes a little bit of courage to actually go and do it. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of things that we can do to do it ourselves, but there's, you've got to, you've got to figure out how to take on some of these things that people are saying and understand what of it to take for granted and what not to take for granted. And if you actually think about what a lot of people are, you know, almost preaching is that you need to understand what you can do. And I think people will be surprised that they can do a lot more than they probably give Mm -hmm. themselves credit for doing because everyone, everyone that's, well, most people that are roasters are probably pretty good tasters Mm -hmm. because they're doing all day. day. They probably are a little bit timid about the idea of being in a room with people who are super tasters, Mm -hmm. but all it is a bunch of flavor memories. Like the coffee doesn't have strawberries in it. It just reminds you of strawberries and maybe it reminds you of a certain flavor memory that's super nostalgic. So some of the that I've had, you know, it really triggers those flavor memories. And it's like, you just got to do what's in the, within your control to, to find that, that specific flavor memory and work with that. But maybe this is all a bit too philosophical. I don't know, but, um, no. I, it, it, it's great for people to just do it themselves, figure out and justify why they're doing things. So. The way I like to think about it is, that, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the tools of like, this is what happens when you do that. This is what happens when you do that. This is what happens when you think about a wash in the natural or different sizes of beans or the decaf process. Then people can figure out that for themselves and take those learnings and just try stuff. At the end of the day, it, it is more forgiven than people give it credit for. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if they don't want to do that on a production roaster, then, you know, try and convince person to invest in a smaller roaster a lab scale roaster where they can do all these things and try all these things and maybe buy some coffees that you can uh can experiment with and i really love these same but different coffees that are you know washed Mm. and natural from the same farm different varieties of washed or natural from the same farm because those are really the the things and the tools that will give you the reasons of why you're doing what you're doing and that, that that's what's kind of guided my approach so far There's so much we haven't spoken about, which is wild. I was like, am I going to struggle to have stuff to talk about with you? You have to come back because we didn't talk about production roasting. We didn't help people who are like dealing with big, massive automated machines. We didn't talk about any of that stuff. So one day soon, I hope we get to bring you back on the podcast. And and just for... For good measure, folks, you should know, I did tell Mark Henney to start his own podcast and he's like, I don't have time. So (laughs) we'll get you back on the podcast here so that you don't have to start your own podcast. Thank you, sir. This has been fantastic. Um, Folks, show notes below. Mark, do you sell your coffee online? I do, within the UK and Europe, yeah. Okay. Well, hello. (laughs) How do (laughs) I... From the Netherlands and the UK to everywhere else in the world. <laughs> okay, perfect. We'll figure it out somehow. Well, yeah. um, and tell people the website if they want to grab it, if they're in Europe and the UK. I like dark coffee. Okay, perfect. Check and the show the notes. Program. Amazing. Show notes for all the links, your LinkedIn as well as your Medium and your Instagram and your website. Will you do me the great honour, sir, of signing off this series? Peace, love and peanut butter, everyone. Have an amazing rest of your day, everyone. Bye.
I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon. And stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.